Hello and welcome to the Life and Fight of a Podcast. Podcast. My name is Jake Cross from Empire Grappling and UK Fighting Championships. I'm normally joined by Simon Price. He will be joining us very, very shortly. But we've got uh, the man himself, Mr. Lacey, back. How's it going, Brian? I'm good, mate. I'm Triple C, aren't I now? Triple C is my third appearance. True. That's yeah, you're the first guy to do three appearances. Yeah. If we've got that right. There you go, mate. Yeah, right, any man, any time, any place, anywhere. You know that, don't you, mate? Yeah, on two. Oh, would you do two hours notice? Of what, like, Glenn McVeigh for mocking him? <laughs> no, no chance. <laughs> he put in a good showing, though, didn't he, mate? Let's let's be honest. Yeah, I feel like the size difference definitely kept him in the match a bit more with his ability. Um, Mocky obviously would have struggled with the strength because what did he come in at nearly three kilos? Um, by N- nearly by four, weight. so three, three and a half, I think. But um, don't quote me on that. I think it's three and a half. So let, let's quickly touch on that then. Uh, Mokiev making his debut. Also, we're both well known to Mokiev. We know Mokiev quite well. What, what did you take him making his pro debut and his performance? Um, do you know what? I thought he was, uh, he just carried on from the amateurs. He does what he does and he does it so well. Um, even the, the bit beforehand where he's getting in the guy's face and you saw that little bit of social media where he's in the lobby of the hotel. Uh, it's, it's all real for him. He, ma- he makes everything you know, part of that competition and part of the drive to uh, uh, to motivate him to, to do those performances. And it's, it's just that style, mate. He's got that gritty Dagestan style, which is, uh, has proved so good for him in the amateurs. And, and I think, I think what, was, what was good, um, although I'm sure he would have liked to get the finish, is feeling three five-minute rounds. Because it's five minutes. It's, it's a lot different. And he kind of touched on it in the post-fight interview. But... Um, as a, as a first outing, I thought that was a tough opponent. I thought that was a, a, a good, um, yes, yeah, start to his, his his pro career. I completely agree. I feel like when he, I think he didn't throw that many elbows, but when he did, I think the first one he hit literally opened up. Glenn, you've yeah. seen the blood trickle straight away. I think it's in the third round. I thought he was quite composed. Obviously, the, ref, the amount of times the ref, I heard the referee say, stop talking, start fighting, because <laughs> just wouldn't stop at each other. Um, and it reminded me of Connor versus Khabib, because that's all they did for the four rounds. Um, yeah. He does, I think, on he's now technically 24 and 0 overall, 23 hours an amateur, one hour as a pro. But I feel like he gets in people's heads well before the fight. And obviously, he uses any sort of reason. Obviously, one of the main reasons is because uh, with Mokiev, um, you either love him or hate him. And I think more of the haters are the people that want to fight him. That's where it sort of comes from. So I feel like they do the finger up, they slag him off, they say loads of things about him, saying, oh, I'll be the one that beats him. And I feel like he eats into that. Um, do you feel? Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I think that's part of a Mokaya fight. It always will be. Like, telling him not to talk in a fight. We've seen it at UKFC. We've seen it on other promotions that he's, he's fought on. I've seen it in the IMAFs where he's talking to his opponent, where it's part of his game. And it, it breaks them men- mentally as well. I think also people want to fight him. Um, there's, there's a, there's, you saw it for his pro debut, I think he was um, second on the main card. And most of the promo, and there's no disrespect to anybody else who was on that card whatsoever, but I probably couldn't, in fact, I probably still can't name three other fighters that were on that, that card because it was all focused on him. So he carries, he carries that pressure in, and I think people have to say his name to try and get, to get those fights. And, they, uh, and you, you say that, and then the other flip side is um, the, the shake or, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the main promoter for uh, the Hawkshead guy. Um, he was saying that it took him so many times to get a fight for him. People saying yes, then cancelling, and up until a week before the fight, um, where finally somebody signed on the dotted line and actually turned up in Sweden. So it's always going to be this way with Mokayev. It's always going to be this way. He's, he's going to um, climb the ranks. I'm sure Brave are going to look after him as far as the, the way they promote him, um, the fights they give him, and that's still no disrespect to any opponent that he gets offered, but uh, we've seen it with other promotions, they do it very well, where you build a, a, a fighter, where you build a brand. Uh, James Gallagher for, for Bellator is, is one that I would, I would highlight as, as they've done very well. They've built him up bit by bit by bit and he's now selling out arenas and he's still to fight somebody in that top five, that top ten. And, um, uh, and that, that's what you've got to do as, as a promotion. If you know you've got something that is going to 
give you a lot of uh, PR that is going to help build your brand as well. You, you've got to, you've got to be clever with the way you, you match them. And uh, and I think Mokayev is jumping in again September fifth in Poland, so that's a quick turnaround. Nice. Um, no opponent named yet, but uh, I think I think I think Brave is the perfect home for him. He's obviously got a great relationship with um, the, the Prince and um, KHK, the team out there. And I think they're going to keep him busy, and I think they're going to give him the right sort of fight so that they can build him as as on the ro- on the road to a champion. No, I completely agree with that. He's got the right people behind him, and because his management team are sort of the forefront and, and the owners and, and the Prince of Bahrain of Brave, they're not going to use it to against Mokiev. It will just be stupid. Whereas in I feel like it will build in the right way. And like you said about the the uh, the, the card, I can't name another person on the card at all and I did watch up until Mokiev's fight and then yeah. I didn't really wasn't really interested at that because I didn't know sort of what time it was on so I just watched the build up and yeah there was some good fights on there but I don't feel like they're going to be on Mokiev's level talent fanfare ability anything like that for a long time and I feel like they've got the right person there and I don't know who the sort of bantamweight or flyweight champion is so I know he'll sort of fluctuate through his career um but it'd be interesting to see. I think he might get two or three more, and then I think the belt will have to come calling if he's still in that promotion. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about Brave is, and usually it's one of the thinner promote, uh, divisions, is they have actually got a, a very good flyweight division. They, they're doing a flyweight tournament now. Zach M- Makowski, oh, Makowski, right. however you want to say that, he's he's in there, so the, he fights out of TriStar. Yeah. Um, there's a guy called, uh, and he is one of, I, I, I called him... A fight of his for ACB when it was the time he was the champion back then, Al Hasov. Um, I've forgotten his name, but he's so good. Like he is, he, he's not their most exciting style, but he he demolished some of the ACB flyweights, and then uh, he left and he re- retired for a bit, I think, and then he came back and he signed up with Brave. Um, but then they've got about two or three others that um, oh um Josie to- uh, yeah Sh- Shorty Torres. That's that's a, that's a that's a decent flyweight division. I mean, they get uh, you look at other promotions. Flyweight and heavyweight are always the thinnest, either the smallest or the biggest. Are yep. always the, the toughest. And actually, if Mokayev drops from bantam to fly, which I imagine he will do because size will will play a factor in, in the pro ranks. Um, that's not an easy division to to make make your name or to to grab a, an easy title. So. Uh, you can get some more shine. I, I genuinely think they've got a, a, a very, very solid and deep um, uh, flyweight division. So the, the bracket has been released there. It says quarterfinals, uh, Hosey Shorty Torres, which he fought, was it Carl Burton on two occasions in the IMAFs? That's right, that's in, right, yeah. Go. Um, and then it's sort of the fluctuation of the UFC getting rid of the flyweight division, were they keeping it, were they not? Jose, I think, was it? Um, who's with Bellator now? Um, his brother's in the lightweight division. He was the WEC oh. champion. Oh, Pettis. Sergio Pettis, Pettis. yes. He, yeah. got, he was released as part of that. So, Jose Torres against Sean Santalo, uh, Zach Makovsky, Abdul Hussein, Mar- Marcelo Dover, Dustin Ortiz, he was part of the UFC. Dustin Ortiz, and he's, mate, he's legit. I've seen yeah. him train and, and he's, he was out, I think he was out with Zach, if I'm right, in Vienna. And he's a beast. He is. He and he's big for flyweight. He is nothing but muscle. And actually, when you look back at some of his fights, he's had some very exciting ones. He's quite an intelligent fighter as well. He's got a good wrestling base. He hits really hard. Um, just saying those names. That's if Mokayev is dipping his toes in that water. Like that for me is a much more high-profile flyweight division than than um, more profile names than they have got in their bantamweight. Yeah, the, the final two names were, uh, I'll try and pronounce it, I think it's the one that you mentioned before, that Vali Murad Alkasov versus Flavio yeah. de Quiras. Um, yeah, Va- Va- uh, Vali Murad, he had a fight with Zach Makovsky. I think he won it just, um, but it was, a, it, and that was on Brave, and that was a, that was a, a tough wrestling fight, uh, but that's what he does. And he is, uh, I've, I've seen him fight three times now, and um, yeah, he's just a tough puzzle. He's one of those, and that would be an interesting one style-wise if, if Mokayev's. One of the worst interviews I've ever done, I will tell you that though, mate. Like, <laughs> uh, you give him the you interview, ask him one question, and then 15 minutes later, he's still talking, and the translator's just looking at you going, I've got nothing, mate, I've got nothing. He thanks everybody in Russia, and I don't know any other names. The um, one thing that is 
sort of um, curious about this. It sort of reminds me, maybe not to the pedigree of the fact that we're in the Strike Force heavyweight tournament, but like you can see Mokia being a reserve. He maybe gets a win in September. Maybe this tournament starts. Maybe there's an injury, and he sort of does the DC effect where he steps in in the semi-finals, wins a whole tournament, and he's a new flyweight champion. At what would it be four, five, and zero at that point? And a five and zero, four and zero record on Brave and part of this tournament might be something, or he, he could be four and zero and then faces the winner of this. It's. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how how they play. He's he's going to want to fight. That's him. We know him. We know we've seen Dean Garnett holding the reins to try and drag him back to stop him getting into a fight every week, and, and, and as in a professional one, not outside. Um, but oh, you know no, what I mean. He's, he's stories about Mocky in the past when he was younger. <laughs> <laughs> when he was younger, though, he's he's, 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 he's grown good. up now. Um, he's grown. Look at us talking about him growing up, and he's twenty years old. It's uh, it's madness, man. I've heard it's, stories about when he was. 15, 14, some around that age where he would literally contact promoters or, or fighters and say, do you want to fight me this weekend? And then his coaches was like, well, no, whoa, you're not even 16 yet. And he's got some fights left, right and centre. Uh, oh, he just wanted to get going, didn't he? And he sort of, it, it feels like a fast four years, but it took a long time to get him to that, that 16 sort of years old. And then he sort of flew from there and took the ball by its horns, as they say. Yeah, yeah, and and like he, he I might hang their hat on him, and he also very much points in the direction of that. He he'd fought so many people domestically and um, and decimated like really good talent that was coming up and through. But he'd made that leap to IMAF, and and for him especially, I think that was. But you, you don't pick your fights then. You 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 are in a bracket, and you get your, your you find out the morning you're going to fight the guy who you're fighting, or the night before. Sorry. Um, and then, then you just get on with it, and that's that sort of put him in against some different styles, some people with uh, a lot of different skill sets that you wouldn't find as much in the UK, especially testing his wrestling against some of the Russians. That was always an interesting um, uh, watch when you saw him fighting either a Russian or a Bahrainian, because Bar Bahrain have adopted quite a lot of Dagestan and um, Russian fighters. They they brought them over as part of Team KHK. Um, and that was always interesting because these are people that have got the same background um, or as in sporting background where they're, they've grown up with wrestling and to see him compete and achieve what he did on, on that stage, I think um, I think it's, it's, it's very, uh, you can see why I'm a fan of on him and I think it's, it's, it's a very good route for other fighters that are looking to sort of test themselves and, and see what else is out there because when you do step up into these bigger promotions, we see on the, the UK scene we've got some amazing talent um, uh, you just look at the likes of Teddy Stringer, Liam McCracken, Marlon Jones, look at all those ones coming through. Um, and you want to see how they do. You want to see how they do against these different styles and, and these different things. And also mentally how you cope with staring across at somebody who's as scary looking as one of the uh, Russian team that looks across you with dead eyes and you just think, well, I'm going to be grappled for 15 minutes here or however long it'll be. But um, yeah, I think, I think with Mokhaev, the, the route he took, the path he, has all been right, and I think he's at the right place. Um, he's just signed with Paradigm as well. That's that's the yes. thing that it surprised me because I know Ali Abdelaziz. Will, if he had any hair, he'd be pulling it out, mate, because he won. I'm shocked at that. Well, I think it's a great fit. It surprised me, but I think actually, um, like I've had a little bit of interaction with some of the people at Paradigm, and, and they're, they're so on the ball, mate. They are. Connor's under as well. Yeah, that's the other interesting thing because obviously he's not a fan of Conor McGregor, is he? The uh, Mokayev. He's, he's very open with his posts about how he feels about Conor McGregor and, and what Conor said. Um, but yeah, he's, he's gone under that under that banner, which surpri really surprised me because I it just felt like it was heading down the Ali Abdulaziz. I thought there was no other place for him to go. But when um, I thought about it, I actually thought, do you know what? There's 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 a lot of that that I think that for that team. Well, that that um, roster of fighters, I think that is a that's an excellent uh, prom, um, management management company to be under. So surprised me, but actually made me very happy. Actually made me really happy that um, he's made that choice. It, obviously, it took a lot of thinking about, and Abdul Aziz would have been pulling him that way. But there's got to be some good reasons, and uh, uh, you got to do you. You got and whatever reasons they are, I'm uh, I'm hoping for the best for him. I completely agree. Like I say, it took me by surprise because of the. The Conor McGregor connection, and um, obviously you thought because of the amount of times he's like 
tagged Ali Abdelaziz in stuff and they've FaceTimed each other and maybe even Ali said this might be the right fit for you because I know he's sort of like he likes to keep cards close to his chest but he is quite honest and if you feel like maybe he's too busy for Mokiev and that's all just <laughs> he, will be, he will be screwy mate he will be screwy <laughs> I'm trying to be Absolutely. nice no, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. But you look at um, you look at his roster, um, Ali Abdulaziz. So you've got your, your Magomed Sharipovs. You've got your new Hamzat Shachimayev. Uh, I, I told you watch that. I told you to watch, I know you watch did. out for that. And um, what I knew about it was when I messaged you after his win and I said, have you realised who Reese McKee's fighting? Because you shared it saying he's in the UFC. And he was like, no. And I was like, he's facing Hamzat. And you were like, well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I obviously that was the thing. I'm like, but fair play to Reese McKee as well. What, what a um, first of all, what a nice guy. What a, what a fighter. Um, step in six days notice. He's not done him his, on. He's not done him justice because we know how talented he is. But he also look look at the way he handled it. That is that for me shows somebody who understands. He's, he's going to go down a weight. He'll go back to lightweight, which is yeah. you think about it. Hamzat was middleweight. 10 days before he fought McKee. McKee is usually stepped up to lightweight for cage warriors, but you look back at his Bama days, featherweight was, was his, um, his division. So, sorry, uh, lightweight, lightweight was his division. He stepped, yeah, stepped down from welterweight. Um, and the way he's handled it is just, that shows you what that kid's made of. That shows, and he knows he's not done. He knows he's got some, something, and, and you, you hear Dana White talking about it. And we know how much Rodney thinks of um, him over there in that, um, uh, at his gym, so I, th I think it was a, a baptism of fire, but that is not the end of the story for Reese McKee. And just to show the guts of the kid to, to take that fight without knowing who the opponent was, if you saw the phone call, um, taking it like a man and then dusting it off and getting ready for, for, for a full camp and showing what he's all about. I completely agree. And like you mentioned when we last had you on, I think we were reviewing 251 and the debut of. Hamza and you were you were raving about it and I must admit it did sort of still go over my head because obviously I know you know all Russian guys and you know how good they are and I didn't believe no I didn't believe that's the wrong word I didn't sort of eat into how good this guy is and what was the what was it 172 strikes of two over two opponents in eight days or whatever it was it's yeah, ridiculous mate, it's, it's crazy and um I mean John Phillips is is strong he's known as a striker obviously wrestling is not his strongest forte but um, he's still a UFC fighter. He is one of the strongest humans you are ever going to face, um, and he, he he handled him just just completely dominated him. And then Reese, I think we just saw um, levels there as far as Hamzat's control in, in the grappling. He's still got. He's he's talking a lot. He's already calling Conor McGregor out. He wants to fight Masvidal, and uh, what's he what's he want? He wants both champions on one night. Um, there's a lot of talk going on there, but I've, I've I've been sent some of the sparring videos with him and Gustafsson and uh, and him and some of the other monsters. He's, he's sparring Ilya Latifi in All Stars over there. And Sweden. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So, uh, it's, so is uh, this, it's he's Swedish, right? No, so he's from Russia. So he's from um, Chechnya. Right. Okay. Um, and he's moved over to. Uh, yeah, he spent most of his I think most of his adult life over there in Sweden, and he's been. Uh, under All Stars since he started MMA, so wrestled when he was a kid over in Chechnya, and then came to All Stars and um, Andreas over there, uh, Majdi. Of they just they, they just said we've built a monster. But you just hear them talk about it. Just say that they don't care. They they take any fight right now, um, and that's uh, some people say that's overconfidence. But when they see what he's doing to like world class people, he, he's he's like, the pictures uh, there when Gustafsson was sparring heavyweight. Get all the other heavyweights there and Chimaev. And that was his hardest round. There's rumours that they're going to be going back to Abu Dhabi for October, maybe November as well, because of all these um, contracted fighters outside of the Americas, which are going to struggle with right now, especially because it doesn't seem to be slowing down in America. I don't think you'll get anyone in outside of that. So I think maybe two... What I think would still be smart is if they could do one at the Apex and one at Abu Dhabi, alternating over a few months, and you, you, you could get a lot of them rosters in, but like someone like Hamzat will want to be fighting every week. This break right now will be killing him after going up on such a run on what, 10 days, not 10 days apart at two different weight divisions. Normally you would expect to have gone welterweight and then middleweight. The fact that he went middleweight and then welterweight is phenomenal. Um, yeah, and absolutely. He, there's rumours that he could make lightweight as well, which <laughs> imagine him across three divisions soon. Um, <laughs> 
I think the the only thing I would say, and I mean, I'm, you can you can hear I'm a big fan, and I'm uh, blowing smoke up his ass, but um, the only thing I would say that it will be interesting is you know, all of his fights he's finished, or every single one is, he's finished, and you can see the pace he fights at. And there will be, the, the, the challenges he's going to face now in the UFC are completely different to Brave. They are absolutely, the, the styles he's going to face. And there's fighters in there, and this we've seen this before, where you get people who've got that one-punch knockout power, where they see someone that they, and they connect and connect, but they just can't knock them out. And then they, the, they've got no plan B. Um, the only thing I'll say with him is his output is so high that when he's got one of these durable fighters that can take a beating and, and is used to going, uh, 15 minutes. How's it? What's he going to look like in that third round? Because we've never seen him there. We've never seen him in the third round, um, and that that will be interesting for me. I'm, I mean, when I've I've asked those questions to uh, to his coach and his his manager, and they've said that he can do that all day long. But it's something different about the fighting is is different to training, and that you hear fighters talk about it all the time. Um, the adrenaline dump you get in there, the the emotions of it. Uh, how you feel on the day, the pressure, whatever, whatever, whatever outside influences can influence the fight inside the game. And then um, I just wonder, if, can he do that pace for, for three, five minute rounds? If he can, that makes him even scarier. But the thing is as well about him, he's going to be sort of thrown to the walls a little bit now, maybe if it, maybe if top 15, maybe top 10. And then because of his name, he could be a fight night in Abu Dhabi where he's main event. And then he's 25 minutes and that's a completely random as well and how quick that is. Um, That's true. Very true. The future's bright. I think obviously this year's sort of been a half write off and an unknown of what's going on. Whereas I think in a year's time, especially in MMA, not just to do with COVID, you'll see a completely new landscape because Khabib says by next April he'll be retired. So you will need a new lightweight champion. Might be Gaethje in October. That could be a span in the works anyway for Khabib. And then you've got the welterweight and middleweight divisions. In a year's time, could Kamzat be pioneer of both? Fighting for both, champion of both, champion of one. Um, it's it's the unknown, which is why we love the sport. Um, and it's nice is some new blood because you certain look at certain divisions sometimes and it looks a bit stale. Whereas in welterweight looks pretty hot right now. Lightweight looks fun, especially the welterweight now. I like. I don't know if you've seen it. They've just announced Colby versus Woodley. Um, for, is it official? Because they said that September nineteenth. They've talked about it, but I've, I've not seen that it's actually signed. I think it's. I think it's. Have they said it's official now? The, it's, it's apparently the only thing that needs to be sorted is whether it's going to be co-main to Khabib or the week after as the main event. I think that's the only ah, thing. Whereas I think this yeah. fight deserves a main event the week after. I think that both of their names... And I feel like you could easily put this on as pay-per-view because Colby does have pull, especially because people pay to see him get beat. That's the that's the thing. But um, then do you stick that on pay-per-view? But I think Gaethje and... Uh, Khabib, even if one of them dropped out and someone else came in last minute, that's still going to sell pay-per-view. Do you need to make a, a big co-main in this place? I don't know. It's Obviously, it's up to them, but I wouldn't mind seeing Colby and Woodley for five rounds. I don't know about you, but I'm in that fight based on recent performances. I go, I'm going to go with Colby. Um, I agree totally. I think um, if he can avoid the big right hand of, of Woodley, the big hooks, then um, then he, the pressure you saw, you, you, you saw how um, Burns. can I say, was it, was it Dos Anjos? Burn? No, Burns. who did he fight? Dos? Did he oh, fight no. Gilbert Burns? You mean Colby? Woodley? Colby, Colby, where oh, he, Anjos, yeah. yeah, and oh, and Robbie Lawler, that output where he just, it, it, and I think that pressure, and that's his game, I think that, that can break Woodley. Woodley Woodley's, he, he, he considers himself one of the best of all time, and I just can't put him in that bracket, I just, I just can't, because he's got that amazing right hand, but he's, he, there's not loads of amazing fights I can think back and think, oh, I want to watch that again. The Wood, the Woodley fight, not the Woodley, the Wonder Boy fights. That second one was just one of the dullest fights I've seen in a very long time. And um, I think we saw with the Gilbert Burns fight, like mentally, when you get in his head, like he, he can break. When when somebody can is not scared of that right hand or is going to put the pressure back on him and, and make him walk backwards a little bit, like he, he's not got much else and you, you think about him as a fit as a physical specimen if you were to show a poster of him and say you're going to get locked in a cage with him you'd go that's one of the scariest things in, in the world but actually when you see his style he's quite conservative with it yeah i agree 
let's touch on you for a second. What have one of you been up to, and what's going on with ACA right now? I know you was doing some uh, stuff with Brad in, in London studios for an event, so you didn't go over to, to the event physically, but you were still doing commentary. Um, what's what, how sort of COVID affected it, and how's your sort of last four or five weeks been since we last spoke? Well, do you know what, mate? It's uh, we tried to do the um, stream from a studio in London, but there was there was a few issues with the stream. So we there was uh, some problems trying to get it via satellites, and there was don't know what I above my pay grade and above my technical knowledge. So we tried it. I think it's it more about your technical knowledge than your pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. But um, so it didn't quite. It didn't sort of work out. We were, we were going to do the rest of the events from from that. But again, when I was sat there and we watched it on the TV. I mean, it was good to commentate on the fights, but it's, it's not like being in, in, in the arena. And it's, uh, it's something I've missed dearly. Like, it's a big part of my, my life. And um, uh, it's felt like it's like... That I've had to sort of switch off mentally and just not think about it. So it doesn't get me down that I'm not doing these events. or yeah. uh, And I'm, I'm basically just watching the ACA events at the minute. So, um, But the exciting thing is, next Tuesday, I fly to Poland. So I'll be going to that one. That that happens as a Thursday night fight card. So that'll be the first one we'll be doing. And they've opened travel to Russia now. So it looks like I'll be flying out. There's a fight card on September 5th and one on September 19th. And also possibly one in October, October 4th or 5th, I think. Um, but it might mean that I have to stay in Russia for six weeks. So it's, it's one of those where I'm kind of like... Um, I'm excited to be um, uh, getting back at it, but also I'm going to be away for a long time. So uh, mixed emotions, but very excited that finally we'll get... Oh, look at that, man. There he <laughs> is. You, gents? How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. Yourself? I'm all right. I'm all right. Nice to see you. All right, good so, seeing you. The co-host is now here, finally, <laughs> stuck in traffic. <laughs> well, no, it seemed like everybody was out on the road today. By a 30 minute journey turned into 50 minutes. I was fuming. <laughs> <laughs> so, me and Brian, whilst you've not been on sound, we've touched on the Mokia fight, we've touched on Kamzat, we've touched on, literally just then just touched on uh, ACA and, and how that's going for Brian. And he, he, he most likely will be out there from, well, from next week. You're going out for the first one, you said, Brian? First one will be Poland. And then after that, there's two in September in Russia, uh, possibly one in October. And then. Uh, yeah, so I'll be getting to the fly back out there. But I've got to do all these COVID tests and, uh, um, yeah, all the stuff that you have to do to make sure that the, the fighters and their crew and everything is safe. So I'm interested. I was supposed to go to Fight Island. That was one thing. So I was, I was set to do that. I was going to go out and do commissioning out there. But the um, uh, it just didn't work because I was doing I was trying to do a remote uh, commentary from um, for ACA. But now tell I'll get they, to Tell me I'll replace you. I've done it with Hotel Lee, I'll replace I, you. I, I, think, I think he replaced me with a small child. I think that was, that's all they need for my, my job. Um, but have, no, you seen, um, um, oh, have you seen a documentary on um, on how they do Fight Island, where it's sort of like all the all the testing beforehand, and it sort of follows the fighters' process? Wow. Well, it's on YouTube really, like, somewhere. Really worth was, watching YouTube. I kind of watched it via uh, people like Danny Mitchell and, and uh, Brad Pickett and Daniel doing their, their what is it, their quarantine... Because basically they got put up in there to get tested before they got on a plane and they had to wait 48 hours, I think it was, for the, the mm -hmm. test results. So they were locked in a hotel. Now, this isn't a five-star Abu Dhabi hotel. This is a, oh, yeah. like a travel, travel lodge outside of uh, Heathrow Airport or something. And some of the grimmest hotel food I've ever seen um, going out. And, but yeah, it was interesting. And the, de the depths they went to to make sure everybody was absolutely clear of it before they got out. They got tested once before they got on the plane once when they got off the plane in the airport, then when they arrived at the hotel and they had to quarantine for 48 hours, and then before each fight show, the commission would have to do again another COVID test uh, before the event and then one after the event to make sure that they were clear as well. So I think by the time Lee Doyle had got back, I think he had done something like, I think it was 15, it was either 15 or 19 um, COVID tests in three weeks. Have you done one yet, Brian? I've got mine on Sunday, mate. I'm very much looking forward to uh, somebody sticking a, 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 a earbud down my nose. No one's maybe gagging, crying the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you it feels like. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like scratching your brain. Oh. <laughs> See, I'm not, I'm, I'm not that not good that with deep. that stuff either. I'm not that good with that stuff either. Like, I'm fine. I, I'm quite squeamish with blood, which is terrible for my job. 
Um, but like, I, I don't mind seeing people get cut and all that and they bleed, but do you know when someone does it surgically? So if you have a needle, or, I don't mind stuff going in, but when people take stuff out, yeah. And one of the things we're doing, so they're not doing um, just the nose test in Russia, they're doing the blood one where they have to prick the end of the finger. And I've got a wow. real worry that I'm going to be sat in a room full of all these hard fighters and I'm going to pass out with somebody just putting a needle at the end of the finger. It's, uh, yeah, pathetic. I can just picture it now, you'll be there going, I'm out stretched, look away, going, just do it, just do it, just do it. <laughs> Mummy! Mummy! <laughs> I must, the, the, the one with the throat, it's, it's, only uncomfortable because they tell you to stick your tongue out whilst you're going. It just doesn't feel right. Whereas in the one at the nose, it's just like someone's proper going at it, but it's not that high. It just makes your eye water. That's the okay. easy part. But uh, yeah, right. well, I'll do... write, I'll document it anyway. I'm sure I'll stick it up on uh, Instagram. <laughs> Let's talk about the reason why we're all here. Then, so I'll quickly share the screen. It should work. Uh, da -da. Look at that, mate. What a poster that is as well. That's why I brought it up. It's sort of, it's like, um, I don't know, like a t sort of two-faced Batman sort of thing. And that's sort of, oh, the, yeah. it's pretty cool. And let, let's just make some laugh as well. Like these two seem like the most jolly fighters in the, in the city, in like the roster. And yet they're looking really menacing and scary here. I'm like, do you see them <laughs> look like the friendliest people ever? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a quality but It's just, it's also good because it's not, the UFC just sort of churn out the same sort of style photos now for each event. You've got the two people facing forward, then the two co-main event facing each other in the uh, boxing stance below, and it's it's the same. And so and these these are the ones that catch your eye. And I think I think UFC needs to do more. I'd be a bit more inventive with uh, with how they promote some of these fights. But that that one is yeah, that sells mm. it for me, man. That's a great poster. So we will talk about the. Um... We'll, we'll quickly, I don't know if you've got the card up or not. I'll tell you what, I'll move the screen and make it so I'll put the card on for us. <coughs> One second. So, so this we'll card gets better every time I look at it, to be fair. I'll have to widen uh, it a little bit. Especially those so, top four or five fights. It's bottom up. So um, we'll, we won't really talk, talk about the, the first few fights. We'll just sort of touch on the guys that we know and we've seen a lot before because one thing that me and Simon realised when we previewed you, probably when you've looked at them as well, Brian, is that a lot of them are brought in from these sort of lower league promotions in America because of the COVID effect right now. So you won't see many of them and you'll see a lot of people that might have been due to fight each other on the local circuit and then just because UFC might need another fight, they'll just drag it onto that. Um, like I think the UFC signed four from um, Contender Series last night, including... Uh, McKenna from Wales, uh, the girl, the only female to beat Carolina in the amateurs. Um, she was signed last night, so con congratulations to Corey there. Uh, and then five last week on the Contender Series. So they are, they do really need fighters right now to sort of fill the gaps because a lot of their talent is Brazil or Canadian or Europe and stuff like that. So um, first one is Felice Herrig. I don't think I've seen her in a while. Um, no. She's facing Werner uh, Jandiroba. Um, how do you feel that she's a little fair in this one, uh, Brian? Well, Felice Herring's coming back. She fought um, Karate Hottie, didn't she? She fought, fought her last. She, she's lost two in a row. She injured herself as well. I think she's been recovering from uh, a knee injury for, for a long time. What I will say is, um, like, physically, that you always question what how people have been doing is in... Uh, times when you haven't been able to train when gyms are shut during during COVID. She looks amazing. Like I've, I've, wait, I've watched the sort of uh, process coming up to the fight and she looks fantastic. She's got a tough fight though. I think this, um, Marina, I don't really know her very well, but what I do know is that she is jiu-jitsu based. And if you look at most of her Finnish wins, I believe this is her. I think she's got, uh, yeah, I think she's got a number of submissions. Yeah, look at that. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of her wins out of her 15 wins as submission. So, um, BJ again, it's as well. BJJ, yeah. So it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's a tough fight for Felice Herring. Um, yeah. I think she's, she's value. Um, and of those bottom fights, like you said, this is the most I've ever seen debuting on a UFC card. Most fighters I've ever seen coming and having their first taste of, uh, of the UFC. So she's the first real name, um, but I think that's a, that's, I think that's a difficult fight for her. She um, was the Invicta Strawweight champion I'm seeing here. One thing I didn't know about her, she went to decision with a Spazo in her debut. 
and then she won by submission after that. Whereas in taking Esparza to decision, which she does quite a lot anyway, but the level of Esparza, she's always sort of in the top five of that division, sort of in the gatekeeper since she's lost the belt. Um, it's not, it just shows that she, this girl's probably got the talent there. And one thing that you mentioned about Felice is I feel like she's, and a lot of fighters are like this, the better in training than they are in the cage. It's just it's that switch that some people don't have. And I feel like Felice struggles with that. She's a great fighter. She just maybe just needs to go up a couple of levels. No, I have to agree with you on that one. Like, I've not really... Because she was in the tough house once she as well, Felice. Yeah. And uh, she seemed to rub a lot of people the wrong way in that house. Um, she's great, like, for sort of drawing attention to her fights and things like that. But I've never really seen her as that sort of top five contender, personally. Um, I completely agree. I feel like that's this fight might be... Um, uh, We'll probably go towards uh, Werner, um, maybe by submission. Brian hit on it, the amount of submissions that, that, that uh, Werner's got on this one. I feel like that's sort of the way this one will go. Um, mm -hmm. The next one I'm really intrigued by because yeah. we talk about how good Gilbert Burns is. His his brother Herbert is a killer as well. And he's on a, mm -hmm. like a five-fight win streak, 2-0 um, and all in the UFC. He's a uh, knee from clinch against... Um, Nate, um, I'll try and I'll get this wrong. Nate Landwer, he was the M1 Global featherweight champion. Was that right, Brian? I think so, yes. And, yeah. he, and he finished him, and Nate was a heavy, heavy favourite in that fight. And then he rear naked chokes Evan Dunham, and Evan's submission skills are literally like one of the tops in the world. So um, out of him versus Daniel Pineda, who's a killer as well, uh, he's had two unfortunate no contest in uh, the PFL. And obviously with the PFL being sort of sidelined this year, there's a lot of fighters coming back over. And I think Brendan Lottnane's tried to get out of his contract or has recently because of it, because he wants to stay active. Um, Brian, what do you feel like between these two and how you think it'll go? Well, I, was, I always wait for your question, like what's the sleeper fight on a card? And this, this was going to be the one for me because you've got, um, yeah, like you say, Burns, who I think all of his last five fights he's finished. Yeah. Um, I think a number of them have been first round finishes as well. Uh, and I just, I just think when you're going up against somebody like Daniel Pineda is so much experience. That's 40 fights he's had already. This will be his 41st. And um, he's going to want to bring it as well. He's going to want to reestablish himself in the ranks. Um, so I just, I just think this is going to be a great fight. I think this is two, two fighters with excellent skill sets. They're both obviously uh, hungry to prove themselves. Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel coming in from the PFL, wanted to show that he's of that level. I think it's. I think this is a, an awesome bit of matchmaking. Simon, yeah, obviously, yeah. he's not fought in the UFC Pineda since 2014. Uh, he lost against Robert White, but then he was cut, and then he sort of went through sort of the uh, the bigger promotions. He fought on Bellator and PFL and Fury and stuff. What do you feel like so, this sort of fighter will? Do you think he's got something to prove, or do you feel like the time out from the UFC will be good for him? I think the time out from the UFC would be good. Like you'd sort of see that a lot with um, fighters that get sort of cut from the UFC for losses in the, early in the career. When they do make it back into the UFC, they've, they've gone back and worked on the areas that they were sort of, might have lot cost from that contract initially. And yeah, I've got to agree with Brian here. It's, this is going to be a sleeper. I, I think like lightweight fights anyway are very fast paced and full of action. And watching how Gilbert performs and with him being um, like with it, Herbert being Gilbert's younger brother, I can see this one being just one of non-stop action. Um, I can see Herbert coming away with the win personally. Uh, I just think he's just sort of maybe tips tips it with. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Don't know why, but I just think with that, like the being the with having his brother there, I think that probably tips the scales in his favour. But I can see this one being a very good, very good fight. I feel like the um, the betting odds will be in Herbert's favour, but it's kind of one of them fights where you think that you wish there was no loser because you can see how, how they'll grow. Um, mm -hmm. And I always hate someone that's coming back in the UFC and he's always got a tougher test and going for that loss and will that make him get recut? I don't think it would. Someone like Pineda, I feel like he will get another chance because Gilbert is a killer. But Pineda, like we've seen some shots recently, like when when Gilbert beat Nate, that was that was a shot. No one's seen that coming. And then Nate in his next fight looked great as well. So it just shows how high Gilbert is. And Pineda's fought the who's who outside and being part of the PFL and doing well in them tournaments. Um, uh, Brian's completely right. Sleeper fight all day long on a stacked card as well. Um, yeah. 
we'll, we'll jump up to it. Um, Jim Miller uh, and uh, I'm trying to pronounce it, Vink Pichel. Um, Brian, Jim Miller doesn't seem to go away. He's been around longer than I can remember. Uh, he is somebody that is, yeah, he's, he's fought everybody. Like, win or lose, it's always an exciting fight. I think this will be his 36th fight in the UFC, which means he will... He's joint now with um, Cowboy Cerrone, 35 fights each. Wow. And I, think it, I think with this, it's a quick turnaround as well. So he fought uh, on Fight Island. Um, he yeah. beat... Was it Roosevelt? Roosevelt Roberts, yeah. Yeah, he beat... And they both, he was they're both got, in that. Yeah, he was underdog at it, but they've both beaten him. But I think uh, they, this is great. Jim, Jim Miller... He's had his battle with Lyme disease as well, so he's he's fought not physically at his best and still performed and pulled out victories. Mm. Says he's feeling a lot better. That last performance as well, and I'm sure Simon um, will have enjoyed that. The setup for the armbar yeah. uh, was unreal. The bit like he, the, and it, I'm not just talking about the the, the proactive um, setup as far as the the, the the finishing of the armbar, but the patience in the position, especially being stacked up by a very tall fighter, just. He just waited, waited for him to fall into one of two traps, either stand up and give him his arm or, or stack him and, uh, and then he'd be able to move into something else. But he, that, that, for me, just shows the level of Jim Miller. And seeing, seeing how physically good he looked as well um, in that fight, uh, he, he, is, he will always be a fan favourite. He is a, a Hall of Famer. And off the, he's, he's, his, pat, his record's patchy in the last 10 fights. But every one of them is a fight. Every time he turns up, and he he should go down as one of the best UFC fighters ever, just because of the uh, the amount of times he's fought, the people he's fought. Look at the resume. Go yeah. down there, and then also if you go back and you look at if you Google UFC bloody pictures, there is <laughs> probably ninety percent of them have either Jim Miller covered in blood or somebody covered in Jim Miller's blood. Yeah, um, I agree with that. He's a legend. Legend. Pretty sure he's got tenure at the UFC now. Win or lose, I don't, I can't see him getting cut. Like he comes out and he puts on a show regardless, doesn't he? And I thought it's quite interesting. They both, like both of them, beat uh, Roberts in the last fights. Yeah. Um. So I think that's quite an interesting sort of, like Jim Miller sort of probably beat a more improved Roberts off um, with a more decisive. Like he finished him, whereas Pichel took him to the decision. So. I think going off that, I'd probably say that Miller's stacking it for me. Um, Come on, Miller. <laughs> I feel like he's a massive fan like, favourite. Look at his record. 2008 was his debut, UFC 89. Wow. Like, he's been around, like, and yeah, he's definitely a fan favourite. Was UFC 99, was that in Britain? Uh, it was 89. Um, I think it was Bisping Lieben, I believe. Bisping in then, so it might not have been in Britain. Yeah, Bisping versus Lieben. No, that was that was UK. That was wasn't it? They fought Lieben yeah, Birmingham. In, um, the O2. Birmingham. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. So yeah, I thought I thought I recognised him. So yeah, that's <laughs> he's uh, he was ten and one at that point, and then he's sort of now gone up the ranks. And like you say, Brian fought the who's who: Sanchez, Gomez, Alves, Poirier, Pettis, Oliveira, Cerrone, Dariush. He's Diaz, Lowe's on Healer. It's just, it's crazy who is the man. Mad, madness, absolute madness. I'm, you, I bet if you went through there and if you could pull up a stat with fight of the night or performance of the night or submission of the night, there'd be a ridiculous amount of those as well. But 36 mm. fights is crazy on it in, its, in itself. 36 yeah. fights in the UFC is a monumental achievement. I mean, he's not a, a trash talker. He's not a... Uh, He's a grinder. He is literally, he, he works. He, this is his job. He does everything he can to improve himself. And what, what I, I love is, is BJJ in there is, is unreal. That, that last finish in particular, that I watched it again this morning. I sat with my coffee this morning. And I was like, that is, that's ridiculous. The setup, the patience, the finish. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I like the fact he's feeling healthier now. And I just, I, I mean, I'm a big fan, massive fan. Mm. Is it, it, what isn't back? I think it maybe must be like ten years ago, of course. That when he was on like say an eleven fight win streak or something like that, and he still didn't get the title shot. And then on his penultimate to get the title, then he was beat. And uh, I remember him thinking that I wish he he got that title shot in that run, maybe because once you defeat sometimes and then you've at that top level, it's hard to sort of get that run again because you're gonna constantly face killers. Like he first got beat by uh, Henderson, Benton Henderson in, in the UFC. 
and then he got his win back against Melvin, then fought Nate Diaz, then fought Joel Ozon. It was just constant killers back to back, and he sort of to and fro in. But uh, yeah, big fan of Jim, and I feel like apart from maybe Joel Ozon, I feel like he's won the most bonuses. I think Ozon's up there as the record holder right now. Uh, in, Ozone, in my eyes, is like one of the greatest performers as well. They fought on top of one of my favourite people. Uh, yeah, they fought each other twice over over the career, and uh, I think they've been split decision on both times. I've got that right, but the uh, yeah, big fan of Jim Miller, and nothing to take away from Pichel. I think this will be another great maybe sleeper fight, maybe back and forth. Um, next, we go to uh, Mirab Devalashili. I'm awful at these names against John <laughs> Dodson. Um, every time I see John Dodson, I always ask why he's in the 135 division. Now, I understand why he went up originally. It's because he couldn't beat DJ. Whereas in it's so scarce right now, the flyweight division. I feel like this is his opportunity to go down and make a run for the belt because you've got, what is it now, they've announced Cody stepping down to make his flyweight debut for the belt uh, against Figueroa. What's, what's that about, mate? Can we talk about that? What yeah, is that course. about? Listen... I thought Cody Garbrandt's knockout of a sunset was that was like a, a rebirth for that man because he needed it. He had such bad press, such bad performances being finished. Um, it, it just felt like the the hype train from when we saw the perfect performance against Dominic Cruz had just completely like, derailed in a way we've we've not seen with some some of these prospects coming through for a long time. Then he gets that, which is a great thing. And the the one thirty five division is also looking for. Um, new blood, fresh blood. Um, what's his name? Triple C's disappeared. Peter yeah. Yang's just taken the title. Aljamain Sterling probably next in line. Um, but you, with with that sort of knockout and those sort of performances, and with his mouth and his brand, Garbrandt could have easily got in there and uh, and put himself up for that. Dropping down, I think I think that's a bit of a mistake. I think I don't think he was going to realise what ten pounds isn't just going to take off of his. Um, uh, physique and power, but I think also that like, you got to be careful when you're dropping weight. You you, you can affect your chin when you when you're dehydrating yourself you that much. And he, we've seen it with T. And you, I mean, he's he's chinny as it is. Let's be honest about it. He's fairly chinny as it is. And I just think that I thought Askar Askarov had a great performance. I was going to say against, him. Yeah, he he should have been next. Do it. Rebuild your thing. Don't drop Carbrand down because you, you you stop in a division. I think he'll lose that fight. I think um, I, I think the styles don't don't suit him. Um, Figueroa is tough as well. I think he'll be able to take the shots. But I just thought the 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 perfect storyline was set. Askarov ten and zero or eleven, whatever he is now, um, calling out the champ. A great performance against the, another Brazilian. Uh, that was it. That's your matchmaking done. Garbrand dropping it down just. It just confuses things for me. I think I think it also devalues the title even more for the, the contenders trying to come up and work their way in the flyweight division. They've committed themselves to that. So um I think it's I think it's a crazy but it's not even a fight that I'm excited about. I'd have rather seen Garbrandt take on whoever wins Marlon Vera versus um uh Sugar uh Sugar, yeah, what's the other oh, say Sugar? Oh, well, yeah. Which is yeah. Yeah. we'll get on to. But yeah, I completely agree. I feel like I've obviously I've got the like a fantasy league with uh, some 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 of my mates and stuff where we pick certain fights at the beginning of the year and Figueredo was one of them guys and so obviously I wanted him to get a good fight next and get a good win and get a few points for that because he screwed me over missing weight in February. Um, <laughs> so Askarov was the next in line and that was a great fight for him and I feel like that was a good way for the it sort of give the flyweight division another six months to keep building back up and you've got Ashcroft and Figueredo a great fight and like I said Dodson moving down that would have been a good call as well starts mixing it in there because there is five or six good flyweights that could fight for the title and, and move it around Figueredo has been beat uh, in the flyweight division so the person that beat him comes up at some point and they have a rematch because he's now got the belt a bit like the Teddy Stringer and Mike Thompson effect sort of that's what uh, that, that could work there Um but yeah, I, I would love it. I would love it if uh, either Joe Rogan or John Anik brought that into their commentary. I thought why it's not? The, te the Teddy Stringer, <laughs> Michael Thomas effect. Um, but I, I, the only thing I can think the logic behind this this matchmaking is they're a bit scared that Askarov will win the title. Now the the, the title was held by Demetrius Johnson for so long that it almost killed the division because he's not a um, trash talker he's not somebody that really promotes fights massively he's proved they didn't sell pay-per-view they tried to big him up on Fox 
moving to pay-per-view and it was some of the worst sales that they'd ever had for a, a pay-per-view card. So I've, maybe the worry is if Askarov went in there and he was a, um, a Dagestan fighter that doesn't speak English, um, doesn't trash talk and could dominate like a DJ did, maybe they think if we're trying to rejuvenate this, uh, this flyweight division, we need a personality at the top. So Figueiredo is, is kind of that, but not really. Um, Garbrandt would, would be somebody that maybe they could hang, hang their hat on and, and would talk a fight as well as doing it. Yeah, I think yeah, Garbrandt it. comes in and plays a really good like, sort of anti-hero slash heel as well, depending on who his opponent is. And I think that does make sense to do that because it will bring attention to the division. But I completely agree with you about it doesn't make sense for him dropping down. He's almost just re-established himself in, in the current division. And he could have had a run for himself at the belt. But I can see from his point of view, like, it's a paycheck and it's a title shot. So having that on your CV means, well, I can demand more money for the next contract negotiations. But being a company man doesn't work that well when you're putting that much of a risk in place. Like, like I said, he's even he's chinny as he is, and then cutting that much weight make like puts you more vulnerable to being even more chinny. Figueredo has power. Yeah, Figueredo, and he's got a chin. Yeah, and the other thing that you got to think about as well is like Garbrandt. He's not a huge bantamweight, but he's still a bant. He is a bantamweight. If you look yeah. at him, he's he's the right size, he's the right thickness, he's muscular for that weight class. When you are a heavyweight and you drop 10 pounds, that is, if you took, take it as a percentage, that's not much of a percent of your body weight. You drop down to 125 and you take 10 pounds off of that, you're almost taking 10% of your body weight. Yeah. And, that's, and that's another, and that, that's this is, like, he didn't have great weight cuts as it was at bantamweight. He didn't always, he didn't look great when he cut yeah. there. And you are then dropping your body to, to do it to, to, for another 10 pounds it's a lot of weight when you get down there when you're talking about you're only going to weigh 125 on the scale you're blowing up maybe 140 um afterwards depending on, on what you want to risk cutting that week uh physically it's just it's just such a gamble such a gamble and when that knockout wiped away that a sunset on the bell knockout wiped away a lot of people's doubts of, as to, I mean, you, you forgot the other fights you kind of went well that's what he's about and he could do that in, at any second. So it's, um, it's madness. I just think it's, it's, it's madness. But the UFC will do what they want and, uh, and we'll still tune in. I think as well, like, attribute-wise, the smaller they get, the faster they get. And Garbrandt's not the fastest in, his, in where he is now. Like, yeah. he, do, he, he, he can match them power for power and spring them down to his pace. But I don't think he's going to be able to match Figueredo's speed, um, tempo and pace. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. going to show, especially early on while Figueredo's moving around and just cutting his angles. But then later in the round, it's really going to show. And I think he's yeah. putting himself at a lot of risk with this one. Yeah. What, what you've, sorry, what you've just said, I was sat, I was sat with Brad, uh, Brad Pickett, and we, were, we, were, we, we just read this and we were like talking about it as, it as it sort of came out. And he dropped to 125 for, uh, to try and get a rematch with uh, a second fight with Demetrius Johnson. He'll want me to mention that he beat him the first time, of course. <laughs> uh, you see? But, but, uh, but he, um, he was saying that was the biggest shock for him, dropping down. He said, some of the speed. And mm. you were, you're just chasing. You're chasing yeah. a fight. Where, whereas you could match the speed or even if you're a bit slower at bantamweight. And he said he's going he's gonna to feel that. He's going to feel that when he gets down and fights these true 125 or so. And especially because he's, he's not dropping down to 125 and building up towards a belt. He's facing the champion the best, the guy that's done it before. And we know he missed weight in February, but that was an off moment for him. And that was a, that was said that he's never missed weight in his, in his career before. He easily made weight a few weeks ago to get the title. It, it, this is a season flyweight. Who's got a jaw? Who can hit? Who can grapple? Who can be probably faster than Cody? Might hit harder than Cody. So it's it's going to be the unknown. Um, I'm surprised it's going to be in November. I thought it'd be a bit sooner because of the way the COVID sort of working out, the turnaround's a bit faster. Um, I'm surprised it is so late because Cody fought a lot earlier than than um, than Figueroa when they won the belt. So that is an interesting thing. But back to 252, John Dodson. That's how it when we were off on a tangent uh, against Merab. Um, Brian, how do you see this one going? Do you know what? Um... 
Dodson had a good win on his last fight. He was losing that fight against Nathaniel. And then uh, Nathaniel, I think, got a little bit over-eager and got caught. And that, that's what happened. Dodson hit so hard. We've seen him starch so many people. We've seen him um, knock, knock a lot of people out. But uh, I think Merab is a, is a beast. I think he, he comes from that camp with um, Ray Longo, um, Aljamain Sterling people. And they talk about like the engine on this guy. And he is somebody who's going to bring a lot of pressure towards Dodson. And I, I think, like, he had a little bit of a blip, I think. I've got his record up at the minute. But he had, a, I think, a couple of fights he lost. Frankie Stein. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's, that's right. And then, um, since then, his four-fight win streak. And he, all of them, unanimous decisions. And he, he is one of those fighters that you better be in shape. You better be, your cardio better be on point when you fight this guy because... The pace at which he fights at is relentless, and I think that will be the deciding factor. I think he's durable, I think he's um, confident, and I think uh, I, I think Dodson, yeah, is just not going to be able to handle that sort of pressure. I feel like I, I agree with that one. I feel like Dodson will, um, will most likely drop this one, maybe by United decision. That's where Merev seems to be good at taking the pace and, and, and getting the UD there. Uh, maybe Dodson moves down to fly like we discussed, maybe refilters back into there. Um, it's, it, I don't think it'll be fight of the night that. I feel like it'll just be a straightforward back and forth and maybe Rab takes it. Um, the next fight I'm really interested in, and I'm, I'm shocked this isn't the core main. I know Sean O'Malley's got the pull there, but I feel like based on rankings and previous champions, JDS should be, should be core main. But what a fight this is against two guys that can knock each other out. And obviously, yeah. I know uh, Rosenstruck came unstuck in his last fight, but most people do come unstuck against someone like Nganu. Um, yeah, he's still trying to find his soul. <laughs> <laughs> now, just like I mentioned before about Figueredo, I've got Rosenstruck on, on, on my roster to get my points. So I want him to win, but I feel like JDS is that season right now and seems to be stepping up a few gears. I feel like this might be still a bad test for, for Rosenstruck, but... JDS has been finished. He has got that a, a weak chin on occasion, and Rosenstruck can can finish people. Uh, Brian, how do you see it? Do you know, I think um, it's 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 an interesting one because Rosenstruck is coming back off his first loss, and there's always that question of how you take that. And it's not just a loss; twenty seconds in Garnu finished him in. Um, so you've got to wipe that away. And when you're going in with somebody with excellent boxing, really good hands like JDS. Um, I think Rosenstruck just he, he fought a monster and he got caught by Ngannou. I think that that's um, that that will be a blip. I think he's got a lot to offer this heavyweight division and he's got a lot of years left in him. JDS still never quite been the same since those Cain Velasquez uh, wars. The, some of them were hard to watch. The, the the beatings that he took. And what I will say is, if you look at his Instagram, he is the, the speltest, the, the, the most cut he has been in a long time. So um, seeing what that, how that will affect his game, whether it will um, it'll stay technical, whether it will use, try and avoid those clinch work, um, positions uh, will be interesting. I mean, that, that's the question for me. If Junior Dos Santos comes and he looks like Junior Dos Santos of the old, he can knock him out. But I, I think we are looking at somebody on a downward trajectory in their career. Sad to say, because I, I love uh, JDS um, mm. and Rosenstruck, even though he's coming off the back of a loss, anyone can get knocked out by Ngannou. Anyone. Yeah. An elephant can get knocked out by Ngannou. So um, I think that'll be a blip in his story and he'll rise again and I, I think he'll take it. I also think he's, um, yeah, he, he's a finisher. If you look at his, uh, I think his 10 wins, he's got uh, quite a few submissions on there as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think... I think Rosenstra had a blip with his Nganu fight, but I think this will be one that will re-establish him in, in a division that needs cha challenges right yeah. now. Yeah. I think um, the way that sort of Rosenstra lost the last fight, I think psychologically you can probably f like almost wipe it off as a, okay, that was a roll bump. It wasn't a, like I got, out I got outworked and I got outstruck. I got caught by a guy that's got ridiculous power and he can sort of be like, okay, I can just need to, change the way I start the fight rather than going completely back to the drawing board. And I think um, JDS will probably try and come out here and maybe try to get that early finish, try and make a statement. And I think Rosenstreet's going to try and take him into like further into the round, really. 
And, and um, plus, if you remember the the Ngannou knockout of Rosenstruck, it was literally like Ngannou was going for a six, was going for a home run. He swung that arm long and hard two or three <laughs> times before he connected. Yeah, um, yeah. So trying to stay out of the way, even if he hit him with a forearm, I think Rosenstruck was still might have nearly died. Um, but the, the interesting <laughs> thing is, if Rosenstruck would have not hit over him for the last four seconds, he would have lost that by decision. So he could have been on a two-fight with, with losing streak now, but he found that finish, and obviously everyone remembers the massive cut lip of Overeem. Um, so if you look on paper, apart from that last four-second thing, the last two fights haven't really gone his way in, 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 in six of the rounds. So it'll be mm. interesting to see. He's not really had a dominant sort of finish or performance since, since Arlovsky. So it's sort of a long time, nearly a year. How will he be? Has he got better? Has he learned from it? Um, I would say Rosenstruck is favourite, and I feel like JDS needs to get out that first round and sort of bring him into deep water and see how that goes. Um, but it's a very interesting heavyweight fight, and it sort of it could either create a future challenger slash champion, or it could just kill one off, and then JDS maybe retires in a couple of fights. I think yeah, I've also got. So I'm going to correct myself on the the stats because he's got nine knockouts out of his ten. I knew what you wins. meant. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, I was I got it mixed up. I, I, but that's that for me now. That's that's almost sealed the deal. Rosenstruck, knock second round knockout. Um, I think second round as well. I agree with that. I think if it does go to the maybe the third, fourth, and fifth, I can see JDS taking the decision. It'll be third. It's it's, it's not three rounds. Oh, sorry. Yeah, three. I think if it goes to, like beyond halfway the second round. I can see JDS taking uh, the decision uh, yes, just from footwork and outstriking him, but I think he's going to have to weather some big, some big strikes. Yeah, without a doubt. I was going to say, you could have the fourth and fifth round if Nick Diaz was in there in the hospital or the ambulance on the way home. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the only way you're getting that. But I don't think JDS or Rosenstruck are that type of guy, to be honest. Um, the next one, co-main event, Sugar Sean O'Malley is Marlon Vero. Um, I'm I'm pretty shocked that this is Sean's opponent because Marlon's coming off a loss and obviously I know people are like fighting other people and it's getting difficult and maybe various steps of like I'll fight you I'm I'm going to finish you I, I like that sort of effect maybe that's not why this fight is coming on um he got beat by Yudong Song and I wouldn't have mind have seen Song versus O'Malley that would have been a decent fight um, but he, he, listen listen did you watch that fight yes did you watch it with your eyes open. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Marlon Vera won that fight absolutely. From in my eyes, and if you look at the um, the response after the fight as well, because that was one of the ones that I watched, and then you go on it, social media, and they uh, uh, just the, the amount of people saying the same thing. And I think this is another example, like Jose Aldo when he fought um, uh, uh, Alex. Yes, and uh, he he they, they UFC went that he 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 won that fight. And I think, I, I, think one, UFC, yeah. I think the UFC are doing the same here. I think they felt that the, the judges got it wrong. I think that Marlon Vera um, has been put in this spot because if, if without that fight, I think he's, what, five, five six fight win streak? Um, so for me, I think this is the UFC stepping in and sort of stepping over the judges on the last fight. I mm. think it's a tough fight for him against Sean O'Malley because that last win for him, Sean O'Malley, that... that not, and, He's got a death touch. He doesn't look like much. I, I've, I've I met him very briefly in um, Bahrain. He was out there to do something with Brave, and uh, he doesn't seem like much. He's very, he's, he's like the shaggy sort of character. He's, uh, he's very just relaxed. He's very slight as well. He's I think he's six foot four at the, at this weight class. Wow. And um, but you you just think you, when you look at that, you don't think you first thing you don't scream is power, but you just look at the, what he does. And how accurate he is with his striking, and um, there has never been finished. And I think this this is good matchmaking for whether Sean O'Malley can um, can step up. He's even said himself, if he gets a decision, he's unlikely to get a, a big fight next. If he can finish, be the first person to finish Vera, then um, the doors open for those top ten, top five. We were quite um, fortunate in the in, on the last time O'Malley was on. It was the same one as um, we were talking about him earlier on. We called the Abraham fight. Yeah, the, the, the knockouts in Garbrandt and O'Malley, like you could not pick between them which one was yeah. the best because you had to walk off and then the finish of Wyland and we were spoiled that night on finishes. Um, but yeah, Brian, you're right. O'Malley has got the the, the finishing touch there. He's um, he's got he's, he's he's sort of like the 
perfect candidate for what a champ, what kind of champion they want right now, and what they need to get the fanfare in. <laughs> Yeah, he is kind of the perfect because he's he's got a look, he's got a style. Have you seen the funny videos he does when he's training? Yeah, where, he's like, where he kicks the bong and he's punching the. Uh... <laughs> he follows somebody on the back of a moped. He's, yeah. he's got a load, of, so I'm not exactly sure he's exactly the the poster boy of the UFC one, but um, he's, he's somebody that they need him. They absolutely he's a noise maker. He's a, brand. He's a noise maker. He, he, he's a noise maker. Exactly, mate. Do, what do you want to see though? Is what Harry comes out with. <laughs> like he went for the rainbow one and he's different. listen like, mate trust just the bold see. guy trust the bold guy to be worried about what hair cut out mate this is uh, listen I'm, just, is, I'm admiring the locks here <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it myself so I've got to live vicariously through Sean O'Malley <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a great co-main event anyway and I'm looking forward to seeing yeah, like you say, Brian Vera's um, one of them guys that he's not been finished, and it, could he could he t- could he put it on Sean, put, take him into deep waters that Mo Malley's not been in, and, and sort of the caliber of fighter in. Um, and I don't think if O'Malley loses this fight, I don't think it's the end of him. I feel like he's got he's very very young. He's, he's everyone loses MMA at some point unless you call Khabib <laughs> um, or obviously <laughs> been about Fyodor for a while yeah. until he came back. Um, but main event time and. Well, I think before we move on to the main event, I can see they, I don't. It's not a sleeper fight. This the co-main, but I can see this one being fight of the night. Sean O'Malley and Vera. Yeah, I can see this show. one being like fight of the night and plenty of highlights. It, it's a strange one because normally, obviously, everyone wants a good fight after a good fight. But Brian, you as a commentator know sometimes you need a, a, a lull fight to get your voice back to pick back up, and especially as a crowd. And obviously. Imagine calling out a massive knockout in the heavyweight between JDS and Rosenstruck, and then you have fight of the night for O'Malley and Vera, and then you've got heavyweight champion of the world. Commentator-wise, Brian, you would be goosed by then. Listen, listen, mate, I've commentated on UKFC. I can go 35 fights straight, no stress whatsoever. <laughs> don't you worry. I don't get any of these promos in between either with the VTs and the monster energy drink adverts you just pound them out you promised me another another commentator like jason furness and he never turns up um now this this listen it's uh that this that i think they've pitched this card right i think that they've done it right and they'll build it right this is this is what the ufc do so well and it's why they're the best in the world and i think if you look at the the, the early fights there's not a lot of big names in there but this builds into an absolutely cracking main card and uh, as a commentator that 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 doesn't scare me about my voice. I'm, I'm I want I want by the end of it not to be able to speak. I, and looking at those fights, looking at how it's going to build up, wondering the questions you got about whether Dos Santos uh, is going to get knocked out or can he knock out the other guy? Will this be a three round war between Vera and O'Malley? And that's all before you get to that final strap fight for um, the heavyweight title between Miocic and, and Cormier. That's as a commentator. This these are the sort of things that I lose sleep over at night. I'll sit there and I'll wake up and I'll. I wonder what's going to happen and which way it's going to turn. And on the day, I'll be nothing but jealous of uh, uh, of whoever gets to call all these ones. The um, so obviously the heavyweight champion of the world is always an empty <laughs> finger, especially if we've got kicked throughout the years. Um, Mia Chich against Paul Mia in the trilogy fight, the one on one against each other. Um, it's it's a strange sort of fight because Cormier said. After this fight, he's retired. Obviously, he thinks he's going to win. If he loses, would he change his mind? Obviously, only he would know that post-fight. But I feel like this would be his into the sunset, win, lose, or draw. Whereas in Miocic, he's sort of trying to defend his belt, trying to defend against another loss against someone that's beaten him, who obviously can has proven to beat him. Um, but then, if he gets through Cormier, standing in the wings is Francis Ngannou. Like, it, it's going to be killer <laughs> after killer after killer. Whereas in Cormier... He wins, he steps aside, the title's vacant, then there's sort of a mixture of people, depending on Rosenstruck and Garnu, Mia Chich, etc. etc. But on paper, just before we even discuss the fight, we'll go Simon then Brian. Mia Chich or Cormier? Cormier. Brian? Mia Chich. I think. Interesting. Okay. So Brian, let's discuss the fight in general and why you went towards Stepe. So I went towards, the, first of all, Cormier is hands down one, one of the best heavyweights ever. You look at that strike force tournament that he came in, you talked about a bit earlier. Like lifting Josh Barnett off the ground and pile driving a grappler, a cat, like one of the best MMA grapplers in the world into the mat, 
by his head. Is, uh, is no, well. is, is by no mean feat. And um, I think he's great. But the reason, the reasons I've gone for Miocic is um, I watched the two fights back this morning and uh, I'd almost forgotten they had that first fight. It kind of all the hype and them chasing the second one and trying to get it sealed. So I watched that one and Miocic was doing well. He got caught. He got caught by that right hand. Um, but what impressed me most about the um, the second fight is again it was there was not a dull round in it, um, but there was adjustments that were made. And we talk about the body shots, and I can't I mis misremembered how this happened. I kind of thought he brought the body shots in and slowly wore him down over uh, uh, a couple of rounds with those body shots. It happened ninety um, what, what, in so he went, what did he finish in three minutes thirty into the, the fourth round. It was only the fourth round when he started using it. So 90 seconds into that fourth round, he hit him with a body shot. And it's the first time I've ever seen Corm, and you can hear it. I actually rewound it and turned it up, and you hear him go, he wince, and you can hear him take a big breath. And that's when he starts using it again and again. And for me, in that fight, that second one, Miocic set, took Cormier down. He handled his wrestling. Um, he weathered, he took the big shots. He, um, and if you remember the first fight, he was coming off the back of his... Uh, fight against Ngarni where he didn't get knocked out but he took a lot of damage uh, a lot of heavy shots so maybe his chin wasn't the best um, and I just think I, I just think looking at the shape of Miocic and w looking at technically how he made the adjustments in that fight I think he's he's going to be able to negate the wrestling of Cormier and I think he's going to be able to wear him down into those later rounds I'm sad for that because Cormier is somebody I always wish got a bit more fan love you look at his story the fact he, he lost his daughter um, the the worst nightmare you could ever imagine getting a phone call saying that your your, your child is 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 gone, um, and from that um, from being an Olympian that uh, missed weight and then didn't get a chance to compete, losing his daughter to then becoming a UFC uh, double belt holder, lightweight and heavyweight. Um, I always wish the fans took to him a little bit more. I love his commentary. I love his personality, um, and uh, I I hope he wins. That's my thing, I hope. I just think Miocic, from I, watching that second fight today, he's, he's got too many tools. I completely, because of how good he is as an analyst and being a commentator, I feel like if Stipe gets the win over him here, and because he's going to be sat in front of that cage 12, 15, 20, 25 events a year, he won't retire. He'll be itching mm. to get back in. He'll be too close. So I feel like he needs this win. And then he'll sail off in the sunset. He'll still do his commentary, but I think that'll be easier for him. Whereas I think the fighter mentality, no matter what age he is, if he loses it, I don't. Even if it won't be for his belt, the last fight, I feel like he'll want to go off on a win, but wh wh whoever that may be. So I don't think there'll be a fourth fight uh, unless obviously there's controversy. So I feel like I want Cormier to win, and I love Stipe. That's not a bad thing on Stipe. I think what a legend Stipe is. Firefighter, still full time, crazy. But I feel like I want Kwame to win more than anything right now. Um, but I still think Miocic is probably favourite. And I think, was it right, uh, you just watched the fights, but was it in the first fight, Kwame caught him in the pocket? It was sort of like bone booth sort of mentality. It was, it was a, no, it was a clinch. So they, they, they exchanged. And like you, the fights are exciting. Every round, like sometimes heavyweight fights are dull. Every round of their uh, two fights so far are exciting. Really exciting. Barn burner rounds, like testing each other either in the grappling or the striking. In the first one, um, uh, they both caught each other. They both um, clinched up against the fence. Then when they separated and they came in close, it didn't even look like much. He, um, he, he sort of had half a, a tie plum over the back of his neck and it looked like he was breaking and he just threw, he, with his head down, like over the top of his own head, a right hand. And that's what dropped Stipe. And when he landed, he, he piled his uh, cranium into the canvas a few times. But, um, it, it didn't look like much of a shot, um, but I think then I think the second fight proves that Stipe can take some, some of the Cormier's power as well. Do you think, think it's an advantage? Sorry, sorry a question to both of you. Do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage that technically, as of this Saturday, Stipe's last three fights have all been DC? He, 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 he lost the belt, didn't fight until he retained the belt, hasn't fought, and now he's fighting him again. Whereas in there was Derek Lewis in them between that for, for for Cormier. Simon, do you feel like that's an advantage or a disadvantage? Um, to be honest, I think they're both that season. Like, it won't make any difference to either of them, to be honest. Because um, they're, they're both the kind of fighter that's only going to look at the man in front of them, regardless if they fought them um, previously or whether it's a brand new opponent. I think they're going to 
break down each opponent as it's a fresh opponent. So I think DC is going to come into this looking at Stipe as a completely brand new guy. And he's going to look back at his last fight, see where he went wrong. Like, he looked like he fought differently in the second fight, DC. Almost kind of like he sort of believed in his own striking a bit more than his wrestling. And I think uh, this one, I think DC is going to come out and I think he's going to rely a lot more on his wrestling and his clinch work, which once DC gets older, I don't think you're going to get away from him. And then if you look at who he's been training with, like he's been like Khabib in his camp. I don't I think due to like the lockdown, I think that's been a bit different more recently, but I think DC's wrestling's going to have elevated training amongst that crowd as well. Um I don't know. I think we're going to see a different DC, and I think he's going to come out and finish with style in this one. I, can, I can see it. I can't see it going to the decision. What about you, Brian? What do you think about it being Steve Pace back to back to back? Um, do you know? Do you know what? Um, first of all, I think if, if Simon's right on that, that I think that's the perfect game plan for for DC. He needs to use his wrestling. It, it became a bit of a boxing match, and it's, you could tell it not in his world because when he sat down in between rounds two and three, he asked the coach, "Am I losing?" But you never hear DC say stuff like this. You don't. Um, uh, he's he's very mentally strong, and that that said something to me about he's not in a fight where he, he's used to being. And I think you, you even had people like Ben Askren saying, "Just take him down. You're an Olympic level wrestler. Just take Stipe Miocic down." Um, and I think well, to answer your question, I, for both of these fighters, the belt is so important. Mm-hmm. They they both talked about it. Dana White saying, "Whoever wins this will be the greatest heavyweight of all time." Um, that's just Dana White hyping a fight. Arguably, you could say that. Um, but I think there's, this, there's something we've not touched on, which is behind this fight, which is going to be motivation for both of them. John Jones. John Jones is sort of floating in the background. Javier Mendez said if, if Cormier wins this one and uh, Dana White phones with a, a John Jones offer at heavyweight, a lot of money on the table, he, he can't see... Cormier turning it down. I agree. There's the the age old rivalry that Stipe Miocic has been calling John Jones up to his division for ages. And he knows he's one of these, another one of these fighters where he doesn't get the respect he deserves. He's he's got the amazing story of being an active firefighter. The reason this fight hasn't happened sooner is he's put his belt down and his gloves down and he's been fighting fires out there in Cleveland and uh, helping the people during um, all these these issues, the riots, all that. That's his priority. But um, I think. Every, every champion wants to get that that fight that would sort of establish them or be remembered for. And John Jones is that fight at heavyweight, at light heavyweight. Um, if he drops down for Adesanya, at middleweight. Uh, so I think behind this fight is the other story of what happens if John Jones then puts his hand on and says, I will take on the, the winner of this. So, um, yeah, they fought each other twice before DC and Cormier. Um, I think the belt is very important. Cormier's legacy for him, he wants to finish on this high. But I, I don't think that'll be the end of the story. I think whatever whoever wins this can see behind this fight is uh, is is that red panty night of uh, of John Jones. Very interesting. Another spanner in the works, and that's one thing I do love about, um, especially the way the the UFC sort of put these fights on, is that the stories behind it. And I know you see that in other organisations as well, but. I love the fact that the storylines are building into it or building off that. And obviously that's a good thing for commentators to speak about. And I feel like that's what gets people invested. Rather than it's just A versus B, it's name versus name. Here's the reason why it is. It built up to this. They've had similar opponents or they fought before or this guy beat the other guy's teammate or if this guy wins, he'll get this guy next or, or girl next or whatever. Obviously, girl, you know what I mean? If female fights as well. Um I think it's a great card, and especially in lockdown, we seem to be getting good fights after good fights, and um, we're not getting the most biggest names on the card from 1 to 11, but especially the main cards right now, there's some great fights, and I think uh, also we've got fight. I think they've got a, a, something every weekend, but next month's pay-per-view is that uh, Adesanya versus, um, what's his face, uh, the Brazilian? Oh, but, but what's uh, his Paul, name? Paul Costa. Paracosta, yes, yes. So that's another great one in a month. Um, but qu- really quickly before we, we let you go because it's um, we're running out of time, is uh, Brian, um, fight of the night and who's going to be standout of the night? Oh, fight, fight of the night. Um, I think O'Malley and Vera. I think that, that could steal it. Um, and then, oof, 
I think, but yeah, I, I want Cormier to win, and then that will be the story of the night. That that final moment, that that rocky moment where he's got the belt over his shoulder, um, and he's walking into the sunset. That that for me would be the the perfect fairy tale, and I think no one deserves it more. Um, and uh, and despite me picking Miocic, uh, my heart is one hundred percent Daniel Cormier. Simon. Exactly, like pretty much to the way that I'm out for that, mate. Like, I'm exactly in the same boat with that. I was sort of torn between the Jim Miller and uh, Vince Purcell fight, fight as well, but I do think O'Malley and Vera is going to be an absolute barn burner, and I can see DC coming off with an absolute blinder of, an, of a performance. The come on, come on, <laughs> you just said goosebumps, about... mate. Goosebumps, he gets the he gets the uh, this is just me just creating up obviously because they're in the apex, so they, they could do a bit more and make it a bit more sort of like fun. He could like call me, he gets a belt, he's got it over his shoulder, they put a bright light on him, he's walking towards the light, that's the end of his career, like a bit like Truman Show sort of thing at the end, and <laughs> that's the end of his career. Or he literally sits down with his belt, puts his commentator things on, and goes. I'm with you now full time. It would be like a little transition. Obviously, you've got the John Jones effect, like you said, Brian. But uh, there's loads of things we could do at the end. But it's been a pleasure, lads. Um, we'll get this out ASAP. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to this one this weekend. Um, but yeah, stay in touch, stay safe, and we'll uh, we'll speak soon. Love, lovely to see your faces. Pleasure. All right. That's, uh, when am I coming on for the fourth time? Yeah. We'll we'll hey? we'll do it for two fifty three. We'll do it for Desan- Edisanya and Costa. Yeah. Done. So take care, gents. Nice to see you, all right? Take care, mate.